In this special episode of the Church Security Roll Call, we're going to be discussing the minimum firearm standards for safety team members. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Chris with the Sheepdog Church Security Academy, and this is your Church Security Roll Call. Today we're, we have a special show for you. We're going to be discussing the minimum firearm standards for safety team members. Now, there's not an article related to this, but there is going to be a download that's going to help you a great deal with getting your tra team trained up. So let's begin in the Bible as we always do. This verse is 1 Samuel 17, verse 40, and it reads like this. Then David took his shepherd's staff, selected five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in the pocket of his shepherd's pack, and with his sling in his hand approached Goliath. Good verse for us today because we're talking about weapons proficiency. And David getting ready, uh, collecting his smooth stones uh, for the future battle, selected five. Now David actually had a great deal of confidence in his firearms capacity, his firearms marksmanship, because Goliath had four brothers. So basically, David was counting on a one-shot, one-kill kind of scenario five times in a row. And that's something that we need to train for. Uh, certainly David, relying on God, as we well know. But we also know that he was well-practiced in this. As a shepherd, he was constantly using his sling against uh, predators that would come after the flock. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to be in a constant state of training and practicing in order to, in order to be as proficient, hopefully, as David, right? Five shots, five bad guys. <clears throat> so we need to have some sort of standards. And the standard that I want to share with you, and let me switch over to a different view real quick. All right, there we go. Is I want to recommend that you strive, you and your team strive to meet what's the considered the FBI's qualification course of fire. So this is designed actually for their agents. And so what we want to do, and the reason I like the FBI standards is for a couple of reasons. Number one reason I like it is because the agent standard requires you to draw your weapon from a concealed holster, which is exactly how most of us, if not all of us, um, carry in church. And so what I don't like about other qualifications is it's often open carry. And I got to tell you, I did that myself with my team. In fact, I probably could share you some videos of my team training. We all had open carry, and we're engaging our tar targets, drawing from that holster. And but that's not how we actually—that's not actually how we carry. And so, therefore, we're not training as we fight. And so, that's one of the reasons I like the FBI standards. The other reason I like the FBI standards really has to do with the fact that um, I'm talking to 50 states, and so to have a federal standard. Um, is good for you, right? Because one, if you're if if something bad happened and you had to go to court, and you said, "Listen, my team members demonstrated proficiency um, using the FBI standard as um, as kind of a, a measuring stick, as a comparison stick." Well, you can see what you're doing there is you're meeting a standard that you don't have to meet. You're exceeding any sort of standard you would have at just a private citizen, you're doing that federal level, and regardless of what state you're in, it's like, listen, I'm doing the federal level. You know, what more would you expect from us? And they demonstrate proficiency, and this is, you know, what they did. So that's kind of a, I, I guess it's an elevated standard that's um, going to speak to everybody in all their other states. The other thing, um, another good standard, and I know a lot of you guys, you have connections, and you can get these kind of standards relatively easy is your state standards for police officers. The post standards are good to follow. The exception is, is this, is you have to make the adjustment that you're not drawing from the open carry, which I've already covered. You're gonna to have to do it from concealed carry. So if you do the FBI qualifications course of fire, or you do your state law enforcement's um, course of fire, either one is gonna be extremely good 
And uh, the one we're going to be offering through that little, I'll show you here in a little bit, where you can just go into the comment section and you can get a copy of what I'm showing you right now on the screen. But real quick, I'm just going to cover this. I know a lot of you, um, you're already running ranges. You have a pretty good idea of how to read these kind of documents. Um, I just want to go through it real quick to give you an idea of how this might be different than your standard law enforcement one where it's going to be 50 rounds of fire. This is 60 rounds of fire. Um, they have a recommendation for the target type. It basically looks like a bowling pin. Um, it's the QIT99 target. Um, I think it's good to use. I was kind of looking around to see what's out there recently. And most of these, you're just shooting at something that looks like a bowling pin. Um, what I don't like about that is this, is the military learned a long time ago that when you're shooting at something that looks like a target, um, you're conditioning yourself to shoot at something that doesn't look like a target. And so what are, you know, <laughs> that, that doesn't look like a person. And so the military learned that if they use silhouettes, human-shaped targets, what you started to do is you started to shift, um, you're desensitizing your trainees to shoot at people, basically. So um, they use the QIT99. I would recommend, I, I found one, and I don't know how readily available it was, but it was the human silhouette, and then it had the Q. IT99 over it. The other way you could get around this is this, is if you go to a target range where they have human silhouettes and you put the, the, this target on top of it, you know, you'll get both then, right? So you got the cardboard cutout that looks like a person and this is just attached on it. That may be a way to get around it. Either way, use the correct QIT99 and um, to Make sure it's a human silhouette that you're shooting at. All right, each round is one point, um, which is pretty standard, but I know some places they'll be like, oh, you get five points if you hit this, and four if you hit this, three, two, one. Um, this is one one hit, one point. Um, each, each course of fire is done from concealed position, extremely important for us. Um, any on the, any, any target within the, okay, basically if you hit the target in the target area, it counts. Um, agents have to score um, 48 out of 60, and instructors have to do 54 out of 60. That's the recommended standard. That's the recommendation I think we should do. And then they have your typical courses of fire that you've probably done a hundred times if you've done any sort of law enforcement security work. You know, three rounds, you know, draw three rounds, from the strong hand, then three rounds, you know, weak hand, and on and on and on. And I'm not going to read all of these. Um, one of the things you'll notice here is they have um, a time requirement. This means you're probably going to need a stopwatch and or a stop clock, which is specially made for this kind of thing. Um, I think what you're going to find, something for you to consider is this. When you add the time component, even your best shooters, some of your better shooters, are suddenly going to be shooting very poorly because of that pressure of that three seconds, you know, or that four seconds, or six seconds, eight seconds. It puts time pressure, and it's a psychological pressure. I think it's an extremely good goal to work for. Just realize that it's going to, you're probably not going to have a lot of people passing when you add the time. And so with that said, you're going to have to decide what is the standard that you're going to go by. Now, obviously, we want this to be the standard, right? You know, we want to work towards this. But if you're going to make this a hard, fast rule, you got to pass this or you're not part of the team, you can see how that's pretty rough. And that's one of the reasons that we've been um, changing the language we use a little bit. So instead of having firearms qualification, here are the standards. You meet, either meet or fail the standards. What we do is we, we're using the phrase um, demonstrating proficiency, firearms proficiency. And so that gives us a little bit of wiggle room. Now that we're, we're using this as a tool, we're using the FBI standards as a tool of dis, 
if deciding if somebody has demonstrated proficiency, but we're not making it a hardcore rule. I hope I hope that kind of makes sense because otherwise, um, you might your team might drop from ten people to two people, <laughs> and you have to decide when someone doesn't meet the qualification if that's the way you're going to do it. You're going to have to decide what do you do. Are they kicked off the team? Are they suspended? Are they allowed to carry a firearm in church? It creates a lot of complexity there. Um, the other thing about a qualification that you do on an annual basis, that's pass or fail and it's hardcore, is um, what, do you, what do you do when somebody doesn't get to the range? You know, because maybe they got something going on in their life or they're out of town, they're on vacation or all that kind of stuff. They don't make it to that qualification. Are they immediately suspended? Are you giving them a 60-day extension to get it done? And then you're having to go out again to get them qualified? I don't know. Um, this is why I think for churches, um, working for this kind of goal is very admirable, is good. And it's, it is something we should work hard for. Um, but at the same time, we need to allow ourselves some flexibility in there. So demonstrating firearms proficiency is probably the way you want to go. All right. So that's essentially that. I'm going to make one more recommendation about doing this on your annual basis for your team. Is The other recommendation I'm going to want you to consider is this. Is consider getting an outside instructor, like an NRA firearms instructor, to actually do this, um, run the range, and to test people. And the reason I say that is a couple things. Number one is firearms instructors know how to run a, a range safety, you know, safely. That's extremely important, right? They tend to have um, their you know, contacts for getting a good range where you're going to be able to do this kind of stuff, good firearms range to use. They're often going to have the insurance that is required as an instructor. So if there is an accident, there is some liability or stuff in that. Um, it's going to be their insurance that covers it. That's always a, a good thing. And then also what it does is it gives you a neutral third party. So here's the deal. We're going back to court, right? And there was a shooting and something unfortunate happened. And now we're talking about somebody's, um, a dem how you know, their demonstration of firearms proficiency, right? How did we verify as the church that they were qualified to use a firearm under a violent situation. And it, it helps to say that it wasn't me, the safety director, it wasn't the church itself that was doing it, which could be okay, but it's a whole lot better to be able to say, hey, we hired, you know, Joe Smith from ABC Firearm School who ran the range for us and, and qualified all of us or whatever, you know, we had to demonstrate our proficiency to them. And so now it's them. And so it doesn't look like there's a chance of playing favorites or there's a chance that you're fudging the training records or fudging the, you know, um, that kind of information. So I highly recommend getting that outside person. Okay, so that's, um, so that's the basic firearms qualification. And I think we, that needs to be done on an annual basis. The next thing I want to show you is, oh, that's not what I want to show you. Okay, let me find it. There we go. The next thing that we need to do on an annual basis is this, is we need to have some level of tactical training. And the reason we have to have this tactical training is not necessarily that I'm trying to make turn you into a SWAT person. That's not necessarily the tactical training I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is that shootouts, real live, you know, gunfights do not occur like they did in the Old West where we're just standing there in the middle of the street at high noon shooting, you know, one target shooting at another not, not, non-movable, non-moving target, right? It's not like we do at the range typically, right? Typically at the range, we're pretty much standing in line with the target. The target's not moving. You're not moving. You're drawing your weapon. You're engaging that target. 
It's as simple as that. Sometimes if you're doing law enforcement or even the FBI standard, you might take a step, you know, one or two steps to the left while you draw your weapon and engage, but it's a little bit of left and then a little bit to the right, and you're drawing and engaging a target. That's all. And the truth of the matter is, is real life shootouts don't happen that way. They're extremely chaotic. People are running, they're moving, they're ducking, they're diving, they're, they're, they're all kinds of things are going on. And so it's more of a combat setting than it is a range setting. And so the idea behind this tactical shooting is to kind of break that mold, that habit that we have of just standing there drawing and engaging. We're moving, we're doing different things. So one of the things that I've talked to you guys about before is just the importance of shooting in different positions, right? So we, we wanna shoot from the kneeling position. We wanna shoot from the prone position that's laying on our bellies. We wanna shoot around cover. We wanna shoot over cover. You know, we wanna get some experience doing those kind of things. You know, breaking that, that mold a little bit. Some other things for you to consider. You see, I got some notes here that it, you know, shooting in low light or no light. This makes complete sense. What if the lights go out at your church and the emergency lights kick in and because they cut the power and now you're inside a dark church? Have you practiced low light, no light um, shooting? Uh, shooting at moving targets. This can usually be did, done in one of two ways, depending on what resources you have. It could be a moving target where you actually have something that's on a line that can be moved. Um, some ranges have those kind of options. Um, the other thing is, could be you're moving. So if you're moving and you're engaging a target over here, then you go a few more steps forward and now you come around a corner and you got to gauge a target over here. That can give the simulation of like a moving target, though technically it's you moving. Either way, there's movement going on there. Uh, stress inoculation, adding that as a feature, you know, so this is loud noises or distracting sounds. You know what would be a good one to do? Is get like a fire alarm, you know? Get a boom box, record a fire alarm, whatever you gotta do, a boom box, boy, I'm dating myself, but you get my point and playing a really loud screeching uh, siren, flashing lights, you know, get a strobe light, you know, and have it flashing at you, all that kind of are flashing towards the target or whatnot. The idea here is we're trying to create um, a situation that could occur at your church. So fire alarm going off with the little flashy strobe lights going off, that's totally possible, isn't it? Um, okay, next thing, decision-making scenarios. You know, these are your shoot and don't shoot, split second decisions, these are great. It's hard to simulate that at a range. Um, there are some places where you can kind of go to, um, um, uh, you know, like REI used to have this, it was essentially a video game. You'd go in there, you're surrounded by screens and they would play out different scenarios around you and you'd have to decide when to use, um, uh, you know, uh, use deadly force or not. Uh, Scenario-based training. We are coming out with our scenario-based training book, hopefully sooner than later, and that's going to be a good one. Shoot, don't shoot tight of situations. Um, communications exercises. Adding communication. Bring your radios to the range, especially when you're doing tactical training, and and have add that as a conversation, information coming, hey, bad guy to the right, whatever it has to be. But practice using those radios because even under stress, we need to be paying attention. Reload malfunction drills, force on force training, using cover and concealment, we already talked about shooting around over um, cover. Um, and you could just use plywood with little stands, you know, or create a little door frame, whatever you can do, depending on what resources you have. Um, for predictable target placement, multiple threat engagements, multiple targets, obviously, um, elevated shooting positions, um, you know, so weapons retention training, de-escalation scenarios. Anyway, the point here is this, is it's, it's not about using this document. The point is, is you need to come up with something new 
and exciting, some challenges to to really get your team thinking about different stuff, getting out of the habit of just standing, pulling, and shoot. Have them do some other things. Um, when I was in law enforcement, our firearms instructor, at least at my last place, Brant was really good at just coming up with just, he'd just come up with crazy stuff. And it was good. I mean, we would have uh, swinging uh, softballs and, and bowling pins to shoot at. And the whole point is, it was a lot of fun, but the whole point was is we're doing different stuff every single time. You know, sometimes we're dragging a body, you know, one of the, a dummy, and then we're doing it. And then we're, there, we're, he's just always tossing different things at us, um, doing it safely, but the idea is to get to some tactical experience. All right, so... As I was saying, is down in the comment section. If you go down there, there is a link so you can get a copy of the FBI qualification sheet, and uh, you know, make it your own. You know, make some edits to it. Decide how you're going to use it. Um, plan some ranges with a you know a, a firearms instructor. Um, at least do that annual qualification. And well, I'm not going to say at least. I'm going to say do that once a year, and then also do some sort of tactical shoot. Now, this is not a, a pass or fail type event, the tactical shoot isn't. It's just you need to be there and come out and play with us and let's and let's get some practice doing some different things. But if you click on that link, it'll bring you to this page. You just put in your email address, hit get the download, and then it gets emailed to you automatically. Other than that, I want to finish up just by saying right now we got open enrollment going on. So if you don't know anything about our academy, what we basically do is we give volunteers, people like you, the basic foundational information that you need to um, prevent crime and or respond to emergency circumstances at your house of worship. And so what we try to do is, you know, the training is offered online. So you train on your own time, own computer. You go through the training. There's a test. You take the test. If you pass, you're certified with us for two years. And that's a way of demonstrating that you're just not a Yahoo running around with a gun. You've actually, de you know, you've actually been trained in a number of things. And I'd just like to show you real quick of just how comprehensive we want to be. It's so good to be ready for this one, the active shooter response. You know, obviously, we want to be ready for that. Very important, but there's security team fundamentals about patrolling and radio procedures and reporting and basic ministry, you know, situational awareness, that kind of stuff. De-escalation. This is your verbal de-escalation of disruptive people. Child protection, use of force laws, arson and fire safety, storms and disasters, and mass trauma emergencies. You can see what we're trying to do here and what we do here successfully with our training is give you a lot of different stuff because we don't get to pick the kind of emergency that we're going to face, right? We don't get to pick that. And so while we're planning for the range and tactical shooting and we're thinking about active shooters, that's all good. We definitely have to do that. But if we only do that, we're missing a great deal. And so we, you, need a broader, um, you need broader knowledge. You need more comprehensive knowledge. So I just want you to consider doing this. We, um, um, like I said, we do self-paced training. But what I really want to get to is this. We've kind of, not only are we offering a lot of discounts right now, but we even kind of changed our pricing structure a little bit to be more advantageous and easier for you to use. So towards the bottom of the page, we have our safety team registration. So not only can you just buy for yourself, but you can buy for your entire team or talk to your church and get your entire team going through this. And depending on how many people on your team, the bigger the discount you get. So you know, figure out, you know, talk to your church, talk to your team, all that kind of stuff. Figure out what it is that uh, how many people you need have and how many need to go through the training and get this done here. Like I said, we're offering some pretty ridiculous deep um, discounts. So please check that out. And we'll put the link for that in the, in the bottom too, in the comment section. Um, the only thing that I'd ha I would warn you is this, is this sale is over um, on Labor Day. And so um, just, just keep in mind, I mean, the normal prices that we have are, are pretty good too. And so anyway, either way, you're going to love it. You need to check it out. 
Other than that, thank you so much for being here this week. And hey, let's be careful out there. This program is made for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal advice.